Looking good. We start recruiting uh, early here. <laughs> this is my grandson, Jack. I have to say, it's always been my philosophy, maybe somewhat to the dismay of my management, that my priorities were people first, discipline second, institution third. So I wasn't as much of a company man as I might have been. But, uh, and to me, some of the greatest pleasures are being able to see people develop and try to stay out of their way, give them the resources and good environment and just let them do their thing. You asked me about Ron Graham. Uh, I can remember meeting Ron Graham when I just graduated from graduate school. Um, I interviewed at Bell Labs, and he was head of the department. And I knock on his door. It's my turn to interview with the head of the department. And there's a guy standing there with a net on his waist. And I say, what's this about? And he's a juggler. And instead of dropping the balls, he was practicing seven balls. When they drop, they hit the net and they roll back so they're at waist level. I thought, this guy's okay. Ron Graham is another of Martin's friends. He's an acrobat, a juggler, and chief scientist for AT&T Research. So here is the fundamental juggling pattern. It's called the three ball cascade. It kind of looks like this. Now you can put variations. There one ball goes over, all balls go over. And this is the same trick that's kind of wrapped around, but it's all... I asked him what all this playing around has to do with mathematics. Well, juggling uh, is a physical form of mathematics from some point of view. In juggling, you're looking to control the balls according to certain patterns, certain algorithms or procedures. Mathematics is really the search for order. Uh, people have often described mathematics as the science of order. And there you're looking for patterns, uh, typically in numbers or geometrical objects, something like that. Ron Graham has been a major figure in mathematics for many, many years. You know, he's been the president of the American Math Society. He's won numerous awards, the Steele Prize for his con fundamental contributions in combinatorics and analysis. Ron has been a leader in understanding how the kinds of discrete mathematics, graph theory, combinatorics, network theory, can be applied in many, many different areas in the real world, in mathematics, in, in, uh, in telephone systems, you name it. Well, uh, who is Ron Graham? That's a very complicated question, you know, because there are so many phases to Ron Graham. I mean, he's sort of the, the juggler, the kind of uh, person who sort of uh, uh, gets involved on the national scale in policy issues, you know, as in the as medical societies or, or so on, as well as a uh, you know, technical researcher, um, sort of one of the leading researchers in some areas so of discrete mathematics or, or number theory. Uh, so there's no simple way to uh, to describe that. Uh, in terms of uh, his influence, again, there are many aspects to it, but I would say he was certainly one of the key people in establishing discrete mathematics as one of the uh, most important and the most exciting and most productive areas of uh, mathematical research over the last couple of decades. So David Hilbert, one of the great mathematicians, the Congress in the year 1900 gave a list of 23 problems that he thought would keep people busy for the next century. And basically he was right. Although during his talk he only mentioned eight problems. There wasn't time to all 23. And in, in connection with that, he wanted to, to try to put forth his view of what the role of problems are in mathematics. And problems are a way to kind of test the strength of your tools. But he said you never know whether a problem is really a fertile problem or just trivial, you know, like a little marshmallow, oh, it tastes good, that's it, or whether it was a small acorn from which a giant oak tree would sprout. Ron has had an, an enormous influence on the external reputation in the mathematics world of mathematical research inside of industry. In the 1950s, applied mathematics was PDEs and shockwaves. And now, even for companies for whom fluid flow is important, like Boeing, information technology is more important. And for me, Ron is the person in American mathematics who is most associated with that change. He's very, very smart.
He, he can solve problems. He has amazing clarity, and it's never a machine. He never trots out, oh, I'm going to use elliptic homology or something. He just says, look, this isn't so bad. Let's try it when n is 1, 2, 3, 4. Look, you can see the pattern, and then he'll find some way of doing it. He it's, has a real brilliance about him. He works in so many areas that one would naturally have to break it down. At areas, you know, that he really owns, like Ramsey theory or graph theory, He's one of the two or three great people in the world of this century. I mean, so, uh, uh, but, you know, he also works with me in probability, and he, he works on number theory, and uh, um, the combination of abilities makes him absolutely unique. He wrote not only technical papers, which have become classics in the mathematics literature, but popular expositions. There's a very famous paper of his in the Scientific American explaining what Ramsey theory is. I think the vast majority of people outside of mathematics who know anything at all about Ramsey theory and, and what it tells you about, uh, you know, what kinds of, what you can say about order and disorder, are, uh, they know it from that article. Of course, some of Ron's results are very well known. and. Um... As a student, one of my favorite things to look at was this book by Odosh and Graham called Old and New Problems in Results in uh, Combinatorial Number Theory, which is very inspiring. I mean, it tells you about some of the developments at that time and then lots and lots of questions. Well, certainly combinatorics is a subject within an area called discrete mathematics. Now, most computers nowadays are digital computers, and digital things typically change very abruptly. It's either zero, and then it's one, and then it's two. It's not 1.8. And that, together with the fact that when a computer does something, it either goes left or goes right. It either says yes or says no. This is the heart of digital or discrete mathematics. Certainly many people who are in combinatorics and discrete mathematics are much more aware of the algorithmic aspects. It's not enough to say, I know that there is a way to do something, you'd like to know that there's a good way to do it, because you might really want to do it. And uh, so there's a lot more emphasis in all areas of mathematics toward the algorithmic side of the spectrum. How do you do it? How do you know you can't do it better? He asks interesting questions like, suppose you don't want suppose you don't insist on a perfect solution, but a solution that's only, say, 95 percent good. Uh, then suddenly the complexity drops because there are approximate solutions that are very good, uh, even though the perfect solution may not be, uh, may not be easy to find, an approximate solution is. And understanding that trade-off between how good of a solution do you have to have for it to be practically usable versus how complicated the exact pure solution might be is something that requires a lot of insight and a deep understanding of the actual applications that are involved. And Ron has that. He's always had that. He has a remarkable clarity about him. Uh, it never applies a big machine. In mathematics, we have intellectual machines that have sometimes taken hundreds of years to develop, and then people learn to use them the way they learn to use a computer without any real understanding of the bits and bytes. Ron always does everything from first principles and therefore can explain it to almost anybody. And it, the end result can be a very deep piece of mathematics, but always it starts from things very, very tangible. Uh, and that's such a delight. Now, mathematics uh, has a certain historical coefficients more than, say, physics and biology. If you read a biology book from 50 years ago, well, you know, <laughs> we don't believe that anymore. It's a little bit like this Woody Allen movie where he comes back 100 years later and he said, what? In those days, people thought that vitamins were good for you and for chocolate was bad. They just got it exactly backwards, you see. Well, in mathematics, the same ideas come back again. It's easy for authorities to kind of take themselves too seriously. I have a, a saying on my refrigerator, which has been there now for a few years, which says the main obstacle to progress is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. You think you know, oh, of course, this is the way you always attack that problem. But look, if you really knew, why are all these unsolved problems still there? After that paragraph, it's really not clear yeah. who owes what to whom. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, I was it's still a grad student at UPenn, and Ron came to give a seminar. Of course, it made a big impression on me. He's very 
unusual person. He's a very interesting person. Still very interesting after 30 years. No, I don't think so. I've worked with him before. I met Ron Graham. I was 14 years old. Um, I was, I guess you call it, very low self-esteem. So I'm the troublemaker kind of side, a little bit, you know. And uh, we met Ron, and he was juggling. And I watched him juggle, and I just thought, well, there's absolutely no way that I could juggle. You know, he, he was phenomenal to be, be able to do that. Well, every time he come by, he'd juggle, put him down by me, and say, you know, kind of look at me like, go ahead. Like, you know, I wouldn't touch him, and he just would come by next time and just hand you maybe one and say, do this, you know, and just coaxing, you know, he wouldn't give up, you know, he, he, uh, something I didn't think I'd ever do, and he got me into it. Wilson, well, shower. Okay, there we go. Yo. So as I found later through life, all these things he did in mathematics and the respect he had in, in the intellectual community, it's kind of kind of surprising, you know, that you wouldn't think of somebody who played so much and had so much fun being this genius of a mathematician. You always figure somebody like that is, you know, just in the office. So it opens up a whole new way you look at, you know, everything. If you really think about juggling, unless you are really stubborn and persistent, it could be a very boring activity. Don't tell him. <laughs> but see, you have to practice hours and hours for one trick to get it right, to make your hands go the place you want it to go. It often happens in juggling, or a lot of sports, but I notice it especially in juggling. You can work for days and even weeks on a particular pattern and just be completely stuck, apparently making no progress. But something's going on in your brain, it seems, and at some point, all of a sudden, it's easy. In mathematics, the same thing happens. You can be working on a problem, struggling, no progress, and uh, more often than not, you can go to sleep one night, wake up, and it's all clear. He can solve problems, he gets interested, he, he can put enormous amounts of time into, into individual problems. Some simple thing, and then he'll just get interested and you know, spend you know, weeks or months working out you know, detailed special cases until he sees the pattern. When Ron go out playing his uh, trampoline or unicycles or golf or all these other things he's doing uh, or ping pong, subconsciously your brain is still working. I see so badly that it doesn't matter. Ronald Graham, as I first met him, he, co he corresponded in the late 50s, I think, but I first met him in 1963 in Boulder, Colorado. There was a meeting on number theory. And then next I saw him in Bell Labs in 1966, in February and in May, when my mother and I were visiting there. And I don't exactly remember when our first paper was written. It was written somewhat later. And uh, by now we have probably more than 20 papers and a joint book. I was always uh, kind of drawn to the integers and combinatorial properties, and Paul, of course, is a, one of the world-class experts in this area. So we naturally started talking about common things. Yeah. Ron wants to talk to you also. Goodbye and regards to your husband. Wait for a moment. Ron wants to talk. And Paul, of course, was traveling a lot in those days, and uh, it's often nice for him to have a place to stay. He would often go and stay with people, different people, uh, and he was on the East Coast, a lot in New Jersey, so he ended up staying with me a lot. Ron always cared for Paul. Paul could stay all the time, and Ron and Fan were there to prove in conjecture with him and to talk with him, and this went on for all the decades that Ron knew Paul. 
after Ron had achieved more than the normally allotted amount of success, after Ron had become head of department uh, at Bell Laboratories, after Ron had become president of the American Math Society, personal care of Paul continued at exactly the level that it was before and continued uh, right up uh, till Paul's very last uh, days. Paul has devoted himself just to mathematics and to helping uh, mathematicians you know, push the frontiers a little further forward. Uh, and in doing this, he has tried to keep his life as simple as possible. So things like money and clothes and, and food, those are kind of secondary. And if people can help him out and kind of uh, take care of that part of his existence, yeah. it makes him happier and now, where are you going to more, be more efficient, February? more able to carry on his, his meaning of life, to prove and conjecture. So many people have uh, had a great part of the development of their mathematical careers because of problems that Ron gave to them and the uh, encouragement and enthusiasm that he has shown for their work. You think you had it mastered, and you come in and say, look how good, look at this, and he go, yeah, that's nice. Uh, no, there's always four balls. And then when you learn four balls, he goes, you know, five is uh, not too hard. And you know, always, always give me a little bit of an, a push of an edge, and you always, he had that way of challenging to where you wanted to, if you can meet his challenge, you just felt successful. He made a deal with me, if I juggle seven balls, 25 throws, he would give me $50. Well, eventually I did it, and if, you know, by hourly wage, I probably lost maybe $100 an hour. <laughs> you know, you know learn it, the, the amount of time, but the satisfaction is never a $50 that when you did and I caught him. I've never seen somebody more proud than when Ron opened up his wallet, looked at that $50 bill and pulled it out and hands it to me like, so happy to give it to you, you know, and, and you know, just the feeling is, is great. It's really it had a big impact. Once you've inched your way up the mountain a little bit more, you're then in a position to take another step. And people can come behind you and take the step that you took, and uh, soon you've got lots of people kind of hovering around or, or deciding that maybe something's interesting here. And that's happened in number theory and combinatorics and set theory and probability theory and so many different fields. We, you know, I don't know, we've written 10 or 15 papers together. We're very actively working on a book about mathematics and magic tricks and that's almost finished. The problem with it is that it sounds so simple, mathematics and magic tricks, but the math is interesting and so we get to talking about something and there's a math problem and it's too hard for the book but it's actually pretty interesting so we work it out in another paper and we just keep going off in that direction. I have promised I would really try to get a draft done uh, this year but it's so much fun working with Ron. I mean, you know, you just see these things coming to life that who knows, I don't really have to finish, do I? <laughs> talked to him this morning and uh, I told him what I was working on and he said well you know I had some suggestion about you know a research avenue to go in and so I don't know, it's an important part of my life and uh, I'm pleased to be a part of his life too. In our married life most of the time we are doing mathematics together. It's like our toys and it's particularly fun to do it with Ron. That's why we have so many joint papers, still have more. In mathematics, we usually like to say pursuit of truth. <laughs> it's actually a very romantic goal. So you want to know what's the essence of things. So it's a inherent curiosity. And of course, you're never done, which is good actually, because you want to have things to do. You don't want to solve all the problems, right? Not too much danger of that.